Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 23rd Peter Farrell Cup Finals Night. My name is Lucas Hakewill. I work at UNSW Founders and I run the 10X Accelerator program here. Now, the Peter Farrell Cup is hosted by UNSW Founders and we're the hub for entrepreneurship on campus here. We're on a mission to make sure that UNSW continues to be the most entrepreneurial university. And the Peter Farrell Cup is a critical part of supporting entrepreneurial mindsets among students. Now tonight, we're meeting on Bidjigal land at a critical time. Uh, has anyone read the Uluru Statement from the Heart? Folks, if you haven't, I really encourage you to. It's a really short document and it's a wonderful invitation to this nation. Uh, Professor Megan Davis, who's UNSW's Pro Vice Chancellor Indigenous, uh, designed the dialogue process and the convention that led to the Uluru Statement uh, and its call for the voice for agreement making and a makarata or truth telling. This is a time to listen to First Nations voices. And here to welcome us tonight is Auntie Lola Ryan from the La Perouse Aboriginal community. Lola is a Dharawal woman born in Sydney. She's an Aboriginal health worker, an artist, a mother and a grandmother. And it's a privilege to have Lola welcome us to country. Thank you. Thank you. Nuggenby. Na Nalamaring Ani Lola. Na Darawal Guli. Na Nalamaring Gamaringa Bidjigal. Na Nalamaring Darawal Anga. Welcome. My name is Ani Lola. I am a Darawal elder and I acknowledge that we are gathered on the land of the Bidjigal. And I just introduced myself in our Darawal language. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to welcome you all, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to all of you present here this evening. Um, this is the second time I think I've done this welcome for this very special occasion. I'd like to say congratulations to everyone, winners, finalists, everyone that even competed. Thank you, and what a good job. Our Welcome to Country was traditionally performed through song, dance, music and art. And that was to welcome other tribes and clans to the land as there are over three different tribal tribes um, and three different languages groups throughout Aboriginal Australia. Today we welcome you and hope you respect the land, our culture and our traditions. We thank our ancestors for caring for the land, oceans, waterways, and as they, as they only took whatever they needed to survive. Our people walked the land from Sydney Harbour to the Shoalhaven region seasonally to sustain the wildlife and vegetation. This ensures no families went hungry and how we have survived for over 65,000 years. Also, while we live, in such a beautiful country. Sharing our cultural knowledge and stories with the wider community enhances that Australia has a strong Aboriginal history. So on behalf of my ancestors and my community, I wish you all a very warm welcome. We are spiritual people. We believe our ancestors walk with us. So may their spirits be with you and keep you safe wherever you may travel to or from. Fujiri Nandawabi, which means thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Auntie Lola, for that beautiful welcome to country. Tonight, we're a really big group. We had over 700 registrations, which is outrageously exciting. So we're here tonight because of how important entrepreneurship is in translating research, in solving critical problems, and in building prosperity and creating jobs. We're here tonight because Peter Farrell and the University of New South Wales had a vision to support the next generation of entrepreneurs and startups. And we're here tonight to support 10 incredible teams who are walking onto this stage, they're pretty nervous, sharing their ideas in a pitch. Now, at the moment, they're backstage in the green room, probably pacing around a little bit, practicing their pitch, feeling a bit nervous. And our job here is to support them. So we really have two jobs. At the end of the night, you get to vote on the People's Choice Award. 
But before that, before and after every pitch, I want us to make sure that we're raising the roof. So just before the, the teams come on stage, we're gonna have a bit of a practice. Uh, we're gonna raise the roof and make sure that they know that we are their wildest supporters. Now, the people in the room who have the hardest job of all are our wonderful judges sitting here at the front. The teams will be trying to convince them that they're solving a problem worth solving, that they've got the solution for the job, and that this team is the right team to make this all happen. So our first judge, Clem Doherty, is the chairman of like-minded individuals, which invests in early stage game-changing technology. Clem holds or has held leadership roles at ResMed, McKinsey and Company, ANU Battery Storage and Grid Integration Program, as well as having roles in high voltage grid networking planning, power station construction and software engineering. So Clem has the technical chops to check that everything in your solution checks out. Please welcome Clem Doherty. Our next judge is Camille Goldstone-Henry. She's CEO and founder of Xylo Systems, which is a multi-award winning tech platform. Uh, she's an entrepreneur and scientist with a love of all creatures great and small. As a proud Camille Roy woman, Camille is a fierce advocate for data and wildlife conservation. She's a conservation scientist with endangered species um, and this work inspired her to co-found Xylo Systems, which is an Australian biodiversity tech platform that helps businesses to measure and manage their biodiversity footprint. She was recently named one of the Australia's, Australian's top 100 green power players of 2023. Please welcome Camille. Our final judge is no stranger to this chair. Uh, this is the second time running that Professor Attila Brungs is a judge for the Peter Farrell Cup, so he knows what to expect. Attila studied industrial chemistry at UNSW, has a doctorate from Oxford University and went on to a very distinguished career with leadership roles at the CSIRO, McKinsey, and most recently at UTS. He's passionate to improve lives globally through innovative research transformative education and a commitment to a just society. Please welcome our Vice-Chancellor and President, Professor Attila Brooms. All right, so this is what you came for, here for, $30,000 worth of prizes we're giving out tonight. And that includes two first prizes of $8,000 each, the next big thing for a team that's led by undergraduate students building the next big startup, and the trailblazer for research or master's level candidates who are taking research and years of acumen to build something fantastic. Our second place wins a brilliant $3,000 to help them further their solution, and the deans of the faculties of science, arts, design and architecture, engineering, medicine and business have each allocated $2,500 towards startups that they've selected as their winners tonight. So we've got some fantastic prizes on offer and here's how it's going to work. 10 teams will hop up on stage, pitch their solution to you, our wonderful audience and the judges. Um, they'll have three minutes to pitch and then three minutes for Q&A from our judges. You get to decide at the end of all of that, the People's Choice Award. So keep your eyes peeled. Which startup do you really want to support out of these ones? After this, we'll announce the Dean's Awards and the second and dual first place prize award winners, as well as the People's Choice. And then we'll head outside for some fantastic networking where I'll encourage you to say hello to a founder. And so this is probably the moment where we take a second and we're just gonna practice that, make, make the founders in the green room really hear us raising the roof. So this is our practice run for what our applause looks like. So it's on the count of three, and we're gonna raise the roof, okay? One, two, three. Amazing, amazing. I reckon I give that a 
Can we try it once more? And I want to get it to 95%. I want like some, some of this thing. Make them fear you. <laughs> okay, on three, two, one. Amazing. Enough of me. Let's hear from our first team. We are what's on and we tell students what's around them. We make them notice the unnoticed events. We're students as well and we realize that every day there's so many events going on on campus that we have no idea about. We would help make sure that nobody misses out on anything, that everyone can take full advantage of every opportunity there is and make their lives a little bit more exciting. <laughs> we also have one more member that's Tux. She's the one who tells us what's on by hopping around the campus regularly. I don't think we could have started what's on without her. <laughs> Give it up for Rushi and Nandini from what's on. <laughs> Meet Nandini, an average university student. Nandini goes to university for one class in the morning and one in the evening. But what does Nandini do between those classes for two to three hours every time? Nothing. Nandini's got nothing to do. Realistically, a university has 50,000 Nandinis, which means nine million hours of nothing to do. Here's Kim. He manages student engagement right here at UNSW. He can reach 50,000 students with his emails. But surprisingly, only 2% of them actually open their emails. This is even after spending over a million dollars on student engagement. In Australia alone, unis are spending way too much money on this issue. Clearly, the Facebook groups and emails are just not working. So, how can the Kims reach the Nandaris? That's where we come in, introducing what's on campus, your one-stop app to everything student life. With what's on, students can see on a live interactive campus map what's happening, any event, food, networking, or even PFC. Yes, our testers can see PFC live on the app right now as I talk. But why should unis care? Because 40% of uni rankings come from happy and engaged students, and after speaking to over 200 of them, we found out that nine in 10 students are unhappy because they don't know what's on. On the other hand, 72% of high school students said that they look at a uni student life before choosing which one to enroll in. And guess what? UNS Love News Arc has already signed up with us. And so far, we've had 10% traction. That's five times more than the traditional emails. Not only that, just last week, we tested what's on on a founders event, and 73% of the people who registered actually showed up. That's 14% more attendance rates. Eventually, the app will be paid, but for the first 1,000 users, it's completely free. Later, the universities will pay. $5 a student, $5 for five times the engagement. Businesses can also promote themselves on the app. Imagine 60,000 plus students reading a notification saying 10% off on burgers at the Roundhouse. We are on track to launch at UNSW early next year and to move them to a paid plan by May. By the end of 2024, we are set to start testing what's on with UC Ed, sorry, UTS and UCID and eventually expand Australia wide and even globally. And with your help, even beyond just universities. Our app is live on the App Store and the Play Store. But before that, meet the team that built what's on. What's on? And let's throw it to the judges for our first question. Great pitch, really well done. Uh, the question I have for, for your team at What's On is, this problem has been a problem for universities for a while. We've tried to solve it with Facebook groups, we've tried to solve it with emails. I mean, this has been going on since I was a student undergrad, I won't tell you when. 
why now? Why are you going to get students on now? What, what are you going to do to keep them on the app? Um, yeah, so one of the important things that a lot of people have tried and tested is creating such apps. I think where we come in is students have already started onboarding. We also have a lot of community managers, like both of them, who are also going to help us. And we are also looking for new people. We are hiring and in talks with more, where we are making sure that every event is posted. On the conversations we had with ARC and even USAID's union, they are going to onboard their clubs. So all the clubs will be shifted to that mechanism. So everyone is now actually onboarded to what's on. So one app for everything. I'm, I'm interested in your revenue model further down the track. Uh, do you think the universities will pay? Yes. So you, that's, that's a great question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Uh, I actually like what you said, and uh, you answered all my questions in your pitch, so uh, thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> Behind the stage. <laughs> the only question I do have is, I can see what you're doing at UNSW, I can see you going to UTS and to Sydney. Your expansion more globally, what, what, what's your thoughts on that? Because again, once you start getting bigger markets, that's how your company can continue to grow and be viable. Um, so we basically want to make sure that not only a student needs to know what's happening or what's on, we want everyone to know what's on around them. Maybe Westpac, it's your first day at your workplace and you want to know where you get your ID card on a huge corporate campus. Or you're going to a foreign country on a foreign land and you're a tourist looking around what's happening, might as well know what's the significance of the land you're actually visiting. That's also something that Australia is working really hard on and it's great, we're moving towards that, so why not? embrace and enhance it. Thank you, judges, and thank you, Team Watson. We're going to move to the next team, but I also want to acknowledge um, we had a bit of a lighting desk crash that happened in the middle of your pitch. You handled it so beautifully, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. Next up, you legend skincare. We are at Legend Skincare. We do men's skincare products. I wanted a product uh, for women that could be multifunctional. So I thought that would be a great idea for women. So we thought, why can't we have that for men? We plan to help men change their behavior towards skincare. We want to help them understand the importance of it. And we want to make it in a way that is simple, affordable and quick for them. We are Legend Skincare, a simple system for a serious results. Give it up for you, Legend Skincare. Fact. At any age, men are more likely than women to die from melanoma. That's just simply a fact. And the reason why is because their skin is more uh, propensive to, to the elements. Uh, they're basically not taking as well care as they do, uh, as women do. And of course, there's a social stigma of not being made, uh, not wanting to be made fun of by their mates. And they simply rather seek shade than use skincare products. So what do we want to do about it? We want to try to help men change their, change their behavior. And we want to do it by giving them a product that is multi-purpose, multifunctional, that is convenient, and that is reusable. Multi-purpose, one product to help them with sunscreen, anti-aging, and hydration, for example. Convenient, quick application, easy to carry, easy to take anywhere, and reusable. Okay, so we are at the stages of formulation and packaging right now with the help of our PFC mentors. We have a, a network uh, uh, that is coming from two mentors from PFC that are helping us get to the stage of formulation and packaging, which is what we think is going to be innovative. We want it to make it so convenient that our prototype, you haven't noticed that I've been carrying my prototype right here in my pocket all these times since I've been here upstage. Now, this is our market in Australia. It's a market that is growing constantly. Just 1% of that market is $1.45 million in revenue. In APAC, just 0.1% of this market is $29.2 million. So we think that realistically we can get to a point where we, we can actually do this uh, um, in, the, in the APAC and the Australian market. Now, our business model is simple. Our research is telling us that men are looking for an affordable uh, product. 
Okay, so the $20 mark is our sweet spot. We know that we are within the margins of the industry with this product at the costs that we have uh, researched at the moment. Now, there is of course competition and the competition, it's of course all over the place in terms of their affordability and the type of product that they're selling to men. They're not working too much in multifunctionality within the affordability space. So our closest competitors do tick some of those boxes, but we believe that we can tick all of those boxes specifically in multifunctionality, reusability, and also the easiness of carrying the product. Now, this is our timeline. We're very, uh, very in the early stages of the process. Uh, we have started the process with the PFC competition, which, which has been great. We know that formulation can take between three months to one year. So we can think that in 2024, we will be able to launch to market and then start our consolidation growth and hopefully the expansion uh, beyond uh, Australia. Now, this is our team. We are a family team. Alejandro Gonzalez is my brother. Michelle is his wife. I'm Alejandro, I'm, I'm of course Alejandro's older brother. And we have a team of people that have experience in product development, marketing, operations. We do need people in the technical side of things. So this is why we're here as well. We're looking for that partner that can take us to the next stage uh, in, um, in the technical side of things. Now, men from our research, men are driven mostly by their partners. And our story actually started by Michelle influencing Alejandro and thinking of their kids of their boys to, to take better care, better care of themselves. So that's, that's the, the driving force behind everything else. So we want your help. Get us to the next stage. Please contact us. Thank you very much. <laughs> the happy couple. Good evening. Thank you. My first question for you would be, how are we gonna reach your market? So if, if, if you've got a wonderful product, no matter how wonderful it is, I believe you, how are you going to reach all these people? Well, we think, uh, especially in beauty and personal care, marketing is everything. So marketing communications can be anything from social media, of course, uh, uh, trade shows, just word of mouth as well. So a marketing plan is something that we're going to be living and dying for, and we expect that that's how we're going to get the brand um, outside. So just try to speak to as many people as we can. Uh, but just doing traditional marketing in terms of, uh, uh, as I mentioned, trade shows and, and, um, and what we think today, social media. So that's a start. Obviously, there's iterations to be done, but we think that's a good uh, first step. We can also do a little bit uh, differently with directly with, for example, sport trade, as trade associations, that the type of people that are actually outside a lot. That's, that's what we think we can do. I just want to dig a little bit deeper on that market question. Men in Australia is an incredibly large market. You just mentioned two very different markets. Yes. Who do you think you're going to focus on first and why? Ah, okay. First, um, look, to be honest, I think that in initially uh, 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 professions uh, that are mostly held outside and also on the sports side of things, people are actually outside the most uh, uh, it would be would be uh, the, the the best way of, to approach it. We're not thinking necessarily about uh, um, their their um, activities uh, uh, beyond that. Basically, the people that are outside a lot with sports and 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 their work. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, no, that's. It, it, I agree. It's a, it's a big market. So again, there's got to be a beachhead. We think outdoors, active outdoors, man, is it's quite a quite a big uh, piece. And anything from 25 to 55, even through our mentors, I, I said that's a 30 year. Uh, sort of uh, age span, so it's huge. Um, but we think that uh, it's uh, it's it's large enough for us to be able to learn as we uh, understand what the customers want as well. But we we're not trying to play it safe. We just know that through some of the research that we've done and through some of the peer review research, you know what's actually um, uh, hopefully it's going to work. So just I guess just adding to that, like Juan was saying, another really big focus will be to partners. So we know that, and I know, and especially I know from people that uh, I've worked with and that I've spoken to, um, you know, the partners and my boss is like, oh, I buy for my partner. So that will also be a big focus for our marketing is not just the men, but also their partner, significant other. Definitely, that's, that's a big market to, to focus on. One of my neighbours is actually in this sort of business uh, that you're talking about and uh they're making a killing out of it, so uh, you know, just keep buying big houses around the Sydney. So uh, <laughs> it's um, that's the idea. But I'm, uh, so <laughs> I, I encourage you if you want to get rich. This is an interesting area, but um, 
but but I I am particularly interested in uh, in in the market and uh, and the segmentation, and also uh, how many uh, men in Australia actually use products like this today? What percentage? We don't have the exact numbers at the moment. We do know that we measure by men's grooming as a segment altogether, as an ecosystem, which is people are actually interested in their own health um, and looking, looking good. Men's skin care obviously uh, focuses mostly on facial care as well. Um, but we're measuring in terms of um, retail sales, which is 1.45 million. I don't have the number in terms of the units as well, but we're looking at like final retail sales and we see that as a safe way to understand what the size of the price is. It is also an emerging market. So whatever is existing, and hopefully with our product, we can build on that. So um, increasing, we know that, as one said, there are other, there's already very well-known brands in the market, but we hope to increase those numbers, definitely. I agree, it's increasing, for sure. Yes. So please join me in thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Next up, we hear about some critical inclusive design from Splat. Splat supports play by adapting toys for children with disabilities. We do this by creating fun and exciting workshops that's catered to anybody. We know that we have children with disability who need to have access to a um, toy that they can play and enjoy their childhood. And on the other side, we know that we, there are people who would love to help, but they just don't know how. So basically, we bring these two groups together so they can actually collaborate with each other and we can basically do something positive for the society. We want to create a more inclusive world for all kids so they can enjoy the thrill of play, like, such as this. <laughs> Give it up for Caitlin from Splat. When you're a parent, especially with a child that has a disability, all you want from them is to have the same opportunities as their brothers, their sisters, or their cousins, or even their friends. Something as simple as playing with the same toy as them. But unfortunately for over 300,000 children with disabilities across Australia, 70% of them don't have the appropriate toys. And even for those who do, can often find that they're very expensive and there's limited options available. So you see there's a need for more supply of these accessible and affordable toys for kids with disabilities. And this is where SPLAT comes in. SPLAT is a community-based solution. That is, we unite to modify any toy to ensure that it is for that child's, to ensure it fits that child's needs. So how do we do this? Well, the thing is, we've already done it. And you can see it really takes a village to make it happen. That is, we already started and successfully ran our first workshops, where not only do we have so much traction from the community, but also from the above organisations. But we don't want to stop at workshops. We want to keep going into events, events where families of children with disabilities can come in, bring their child's favourite toy and adapt them to suit their need, because it is a personalised toy. But not only that, if you can't join us in one of our workshops, you can bring home a kit and you can adapt the toy at the comfort of your own home. Now, Splat is a social enterprise. All the revenue from these streams will come back into the company, whether it be for the workshops, events, or kits, ensuring that the necessary equipment is injected back in and we can continue to increase this supply of toys. Think about it like a centered workshop, where the community spends some time, money, and effort into increasing that supply and impacting such a big part of our community because the right, the right toy should go to the right child. Now, numbers. So initially we're targeting 10% of children with disabilities in Australia. That is, we're looking at a bit over 1.1 million Australians to come in as a personal hobby, as an interest, or just to adapt some toys and enjoy. Now, what really sets us apart apart from our competitors, is that not only do we offer more accessible and affordable toys, but you're also upskilling yourself and ensuring that all children can play with toys. Now, next week, we'll be running our second iteration of this workshop, and we're hoping by 2025, we can spread our mission across all of Australia to ensure that all children should have the correct, toy, correct and appropriate toy. My name's Caitlin. 
and please join my amazing team in creating a world of inclusivity because we're all still kids at heart, right? And it really doesn't stop at us. We have such a massive community behind us because all children should have the opportunity to enjoy the thrill of play. So sign up to our, next, our workshop next week or come chat with us after because, because join Splat to make an impact. Thank you. I got a question. You uh, claimed uh, educational as a uh, differentiation factor for your toys. Can you just explain that a bit more? I missed it in the presentation. Yeah, of course. So our workshops, we aim to target anyone from any skill in our community, whether that be an engineering student or whether that be someone in an architectural background. And really all we want is that they can come in, into our workshops, step by step, we teach them how to adapt the toy so they can either come back and continue to adapt more toys or bring it home and share it around to everyone. Okay, so it's part of the workshop as distinct from something like in the toy itself, which is educational. Yes, so basically part of the workshop is to basically teaching people, like we have a lot of students at uni, for example, like from my degree, like medicine or other degrees that they just want to come and learn a little bit about engineering. Basically, we are building a community of people who are helping. So we are actually teaching people to technically do a mini surgery on the toy and make it out of toy for everyone. So that's what we're doing. Really great. Love the love the pitch. Uh, I have occupational therapist friends, and I think they'd really love this. And targeting occupational therapy therapy students, I think, would be a perfect application mm -hmm. of Splat. You're a social enterprise, so you're looking to have impact. Can you explain and quantify for me exactly what impact you're hoping to have? So very good question and thank you so much for that. We are actually also talking to um, occupational therapists from Sydney Children's Hospital and we definitely appreciate um, to talk with more people. So basically what we are really offering here is that people with a little time, a little amount of money, they can make a huge impact on children with disability. Things like as simple as making a toy accessible for people. In 2023, people should, like children should have access to appropriate toys. So what we are doing here is that by making like one or two workshops, we are actually helping kids with disability to have a toy that they can play with. So that's the sort of impact that we are making. Hey, congratulations, I love the intent. The thing for me is, the, I mean, you're helping the community, you're getting people involved. How do you make sure they're aware of how they can be involved? Because you said, you know, people don't know how to help. Here you've got a, a great way of letting them help, but how do you make sure they're aware of that? Very good question again. Um, so in Australia here, we have so many people, luckily, who want to help. People donate to charities. The issue is that we have so many charities, okay? The reason, the way that we are actually differentiating here is that we are basically showing people how they can actually quantify with their money and time that they are um, donating to us. You, donate, you may donate to charities, you don't know actually what happens with that money. You, with us, you know that with $10, $15, you're actually making someone happy. And how we are actually reaching these people, so we're, the first market that we are targeting is actually university students. And we have a very good network of people because um, we are running different societies at university and we have a good ne network of people. But also the next step is to going with corporate and also bringing like the DIY um, kids as well. Yeah. Definitely, and also where obviously university is a bubble and obviously there's so much of the world and especially I guess parents as well. And since the community and especially like rehabilitation and since technology, everyone is willing to keep sharing and word of mouth. But not only that, yeah, all these workshops we claim to just make waves, whether that be marketing in terms of Facebook events or just word of mouth, like I think it can really spread to anywhere. The good thing with that is that by posting like one Facebook post, like which we ran it like last week for the next workshop, we got so many signups. Like it's so, because people see what we are doing and we are lucky to have the support of the community. So I think uh, when we go further, we we're going to have like different marketing strategies. But yeah, that's, uh, that's how we are aiming to. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Team Splat.
Next up, we hear from a team who supports people at a very difficult time of life. We are Innova IVF and we are building a medical device to optimize the in vitro fertilization process. So we are addressing a critical need in human reproduction. By improving the accuracy of the embryo selection, we can reduce the physical, financial, but most importantly, the emotional impact of multiple attempts in IVF. Our solution has the potential to revolutionize fertility treatments and make them more accessible to couples worldwide. Welcome Pedro from Innova IVF. Let me share the story of Linda and Paul, a couple that has been trying to conceive for the last two years with four unsuccessful cycles of IVF that cost them over $40,000. Just like them, we have spoken with multiple couples and they all share the same struggles. Actually, one in six couples worldwide struggle with infertility. For that, over 40 years ago, science came up with a solution, the in vitro fertilization process, or IVF, that consists in five steps. At Innova IVF, we focus on the fourth step, the embryo selection, which is critical to decide which embryo is transferred with the hope of achieving a critical pregnancy. The problem is that the solutions available in the market today only carry 20 to 30% success rate, which means that couples need to go through this process about five times, facing significant costs, but most importantly, the devastating physical and emotional impact of a miscarriage. Our solution is a medical device, and for that we have a pattern and a prototype that uses light to safely scan the embryo to measure its metabolic activity, in other words, its energy, and also create a 3D representation for further analysis. With this data, we can determine its viability and therefore pick the embryo that is more likely to produce a clinical pregnancy. Compared to the solutions in the market, our solution stays up for, on top of all that because of our non-invasive approach, which allows us to apply this technique to all the embers of the couple, adding an extra layer of accuracy and making our selection more accurate, which allows us as well to reduce the number of attempts that couples need to go through, making this treatment more affordable and increasing the overall experience for couples and healthcare providers. With a $2.5 billion market size and a 10% growth, annual growth rate, the embryo selection process shows a great potential. And we are focusing particularly in the United States because of our partners there to conduct clinical trials and the regulatory process. Our business model is a business to business with fertility clinics. And we're currently working with one of the largest fertility groups in Australia to conduct our market fit analysis. As well, we're working to form collaborations and strategic alliances with key stakeholders in the industry, including clinicians and nurses that are going to be critical in the adoption of our technology. Our team is a group of experts in human reproduction, engineering, and business, and we all share a passion for innovation and also to help couples. So far, we have received strong support from research institutions. And in the next four years, we're looking to, for, to work on our safety studies, clinical trials, and the FDA approval. So our ask for, for you tonight is that if, you're, if you are passionate at, as us to solve this problem and help couples like Linda and Paul, please get in touch. We're looking for partners, medtech specialists, and investors that believe in our, in our work. And please, Read this QR code and follow us in our journey to create a world where infertility is no longer a barrier to starting a family. Thank you. I think you've had a co-founder just arrive from the airport. Uh, welcome, <laughs> perfect timing. Perfect timing. Throwing to our judges. To see you. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Very impressive solution, very impressive technology. The fact that you already have a patent and prototype at this early stage, really impressive. I have a question about the team. 
From what I could see, and tell me if I miss something, there are no women on your team, and IVF is disproportionately affecting women. So how are you going to overcome that and ensure that you're building a solution that is going to affect those that you're implementing it on? Look, I, this is something that we have discussed multiple times in the team, and what you see in the picture is just the top of the iceberg. We are currently working with multiple people, including multiple women. Actually, today we had a meeting with a clinician that took us through the process in the lab from which we are learning. So what you see in the, in the, in the theme, in the picture, is just uh, the top of the, ice, the iceberg. But in reality, we're working with many more people and we are also uh, planning to hire m multiple women for key areas that we're actually growing. Uh, if this works, you've got a winner, I can tell you that, if it works. Now, how do you, how are you convince, I mean, you just convince me a bit more about how you improve the accuracy of how the, uh, of how this actually works. Do you want to take that? Yep, I can help with that. So, basically, uh, the normal standard care for uh, embryo selection, you could, you could go through genetics. However, the light system that we have developed is as accurate as that for an embryo testing. That is a very particular type of genetic testing that we can contact in cells. So uh, that accuracy at the moment, uh, it works in around 90% of accuracy. Of course, it's not at the level of a genetic testing that is around 99%. However, it's fully non-invasive. In, for instance, today we were talking in our interview with uh, this clinician. In the invasive process, it takes around a month to actually get the results. In, in our case, it would take a minute. And also, as we use a metabolic imaging technology with the power of artificial intelligence, the accuracy, it, we estimate that it will start increasing and better and getting better and better and better. Thank you. We have time for one more short question. Again, when I'm back to marketing, but congratulations on the incredible work. As I think Clem said, if you got this, this is going to really revolutionise things. When you talked about partners with fertility clinics, government, et cetera, et cetera, I mean, it's so revolutionary. What, tell me a bit more about your engagement with the government, because I think that that that'll be something that the government will be very interested in. Right. Let me mention that during my MBA, I did an exchange program in the United States. And because of that, I had access to some government officials. And then we discussed what is the need for the government as well to advocate for these solutions because they can see that there is a birth rate that is um, not growing, that is going down. So they also see the need of helping the community to, to raise the standards. And by using these technologies, um, they can help with that for the long term to, to cooperate with the economy. So. The, the governments in the United States are quite different because obviously in terms of healthcare system is completely different. But in Australia, there are as well budgets for these uh, solutions. So if we can help them to use the same budget, but they can help more couples, they're interested actually to invest in us. Yeah, and I can very quickly uh, add that for instance, uh, just by increasing, for, just by reducing one IVF treatment, um, in a, uh, that the normally IVF couples go th uh, th go through here in Australia, there's a reduction of 200k annually for the government. So definitely, it will be ways to work out this with the government here on a local level to incentivize the uptake of this technology. Can I ask one more question? Uh, you're going to need a lot of money to get this off the ground. Really, I mean, this is this is one that's going to require some serious investment, getting through the FDA and all the all the sort of hoo ha. If you go into the US market, uh, the way you say you're going. The money can it come from? So that's why we are now connecting with investors. Um, in my time in Chicago, um, I connected with some of the biggest um, uh, investors there, as well as accelerator programs that work either in Chicago and San Francisco. So we are in contact with them. Thank you very much, team Innova IVF. Switching gears, <laughs> Team Ropet. We are Ropets, the ultimate companion. Elderly population is increasing. They are increasingly lonely, and we need urgent companions for them. These Ropets will bring detection and predict prevention and prediction of diseases, which is also a um, really key, important point of this product. 
We are combining different technology from robotics, artificial intelligence, and compassionate point of views to bring a creature to the world that is compassionate, almost like dog-like intelligence rather than a human-like intelligence. We are here to change the world one robot at a time. Welcome Tansel from Ropet. Hi everyone. Okay, uh, there is a big problem that we're facing. The world's population is aging rapidly. And by, by very soon, we have more than 1 billion senior citizens. And one of the biggest problems that they have is loneliness. Loneliness is not just a problem by itself, but it is also causing a lot of other problems, health problems, including reducing people's age by five years. One of the best remedies for loneliness is known to be owning a pet. Owning a pet is a great thing, but there are a lot of problems with owning a pet, with an, especially a senior person, because they are great. Research shows there's great things, but you know, can you imagine your grandma cleaning poop every day? It's a hard job to look after a pet, and there's environmental damage as well. So one of the things that we can do, we can offer a cute and cuddly companion that has intelligence to talk to you, that, has, that can connect to you emotionally, that can also detect your problems, basically. So who can build something like this? Now, if you put together an AI expert with like 30 years of experience, especially on emotional uh, intelligence, a robotics expert that has spent his 30 years, a domain expert and a marketing expert and a things maker, I think we can. Now, there is an enormous amount of technology in these things and we are actually developing a compassionate dog-based intelligent AI system that can work in the cloud as well as in a chip like this, which is an AI computer that we can actually put into the pet. And we can use advanced sensors that didn't even exist a few years ago, like this millimeter radar that can sense your breathing from seven meters. So putting all these together, together, offering a platform that we can help elderly people not only with loneliness, but also with their health problems. So uh, meet Frankie the fourth, our current prototype. It can already walk and you know, do comments. It's almost talking. And we are do uh, putting a lot of sensors on him. So uh, we have other uh, ones as well. Uh, we have, obviously, uh, there are a lot of competitors in the area, but they are firmly in two groups. One is uh, what we call uh, the, the, you know, the, the Terminator movie props. And they are actually scary. We talk to elderly people, nobody wants them in their house. And there are cute and cuddly ones, but they're not smart. So there is actually a spot, very sweet spot, that we can bring everything together, offer people an incredible companion using the technology that we have. There's a huge target market. And you know, in just Australia, we have 4.76 million potential uh, like Australians that we can have. But we are focusing on B2B. Uh, business to business, focusing on elderly age care places and uh, home care customers. Now, uh, we are hoping to have a first MVP by August 24, maybe earlier. We're going to change the world one, maybe one million robots at a time. Help us. Thank you. Congratulations. I mean, that is a, a really, really challenging problem the world is facing increasingly, and it's a very uh, innovative solution. My question for you, it is so innovative, but also so simple. What gives you a competitive advantage over others? It's actually simple and not at the same time, doing it right at the same time. There are a lot of people doing robotic pets, and they have expertise in either in robotics and AI, and there are not many combinations of robotics and AI. There are many experts that claim that they are AI experts, there are many, very, very few truly AI experts that can do this, and they are really highly like, uh, employed by really big organizations. And it may seem simple, the idea may seem simple, bringing them together is not. There are not many people who can do that. 
Robo pet is very cute. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, Grace from the co-founder of Andromeda is a good friend of mine, so I know it's a very, very big market. Uh, the B2B space can be difficult in elderly aged care and home care. Can you tell me a little bit more about your traction in the space to date? Uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll go. And this sort of segue to your earlier question around um, IP. So we need to collect a lot of data. And you, you mentioned that elderly space is quite challenging, but we have a doctor in genealogy here. So we, um, part of the getting there is to actually get pilot with some of these groups, which we started to have some discussions with, but that's one of the key parts of our strategy. So great question, but yeah, that's part of where we want to go to get to that BBP, MVP. Do you want to talk a little bit about the data? Yeah, right. Um, so obviously in aged care, um, we don't really detect or like collect data to predict or prevent diseases. So that's an area that we wanna tap on and really it's a big market in Australia and this is where we're gonna get the data to improve our model and also uh, get them to know us better as well. Uh, a very interesting presentation. I think my wife would sign up straight away for Frankie, that's for sure. Um, the, uh, in the, I, mean, I think it's a really interesting market you're, you're chasing here. I think it's uh, I think it's got real possibilities. My question is, at what price point can you deliver Frankie for the market? Well, initially, the, obviously, the, the first price point that we are developing the prototype is a bit high. But when you mass produce them, the only expense is the software that we're putting together because everything else is actually put together by other people. So we, wh that's why we call them non-competitors. We can take any of the platforms, make them more intelligent and sell them like AMG to be like Mercedes. So... Uh, our cost is re directly related to their cost plus what we can add. We're not going to build them from scratch, basically. So what's the price point? So the minimum is about $1,000 and then some subscription, and it can go up to different models. There are some models that can actually run with you about 40 kilometers, and they are quite expensive. Okay, that's it. That's it. Uh, full production. You're figuring about $1,000 is the price point. Is that right? That's what we're achieving. Okay, thanks. Time. Thank you, team. By the, way, by the way, I should add, uh, if you want to get a schnauzer or a live one, it costs about eight grand at the moment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we will have a custom design uh, app, actually. You, you, you should be able to select the genes and design your <laughs> pet. There's your real competitor, a real dog. Thank you so much, team Ropet. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And we are back, folks, and we're going to hear from Team Verily, who's solving medical certificates. We are Verily, and we are a software as a service platform designed to authenticate medical certificates by automating current methods of verification. This idea was initially sparked from wanting to level up the playing field that some students and employees attempt to exploit. We wanted to build a community based around trust, integrity, and honesty. And we believe this can best be done through transparency. Our team is so excited to bring Verily to life. Welcome Jing from Verily. Hi. So looking at all of you, you all look like really upstanding citizens. So. I bet for most of you, you have never even thought about forging a medical certificate. But 31% of the 174 students we interviewed would disagree with you. And UNSW is well aware of this, seeing as 82% of all student misconduct penalties comes from falsified documents. Now you may be wondering why. Well, I urge you to think back to your first year in uni. I know during my first exam season, I was so stressed and overwhelmed that I truly felt as if I would do anything to make it through, even if that meant forgery. Now take a look at this and this. One of these certificates is forged. Can you take a guess at which one? The Verily team, sorry, I mean, an undisclosed anonymous figure created the one on the left in under 15 minutes, just on Microsoft Word. Forgery has never been easier. And on top of this, the only way to verify any medical certificate is for staff to physically call up the clinic and confirm the information provided on the medical certificate. So for this simple problem, we've created an even simpler solution. Verily, Verily revolutionizes medical certificate authentication by automating the currently available processes without the need to collect any data. And to show you how it works, I'll tell you a little story. Last semester, I applied for special considerations for the first time, having to navigate through the complex chain of interactions between myself, the special considerations department, and my GP left me stressed, overwhelmed, and confused on top of already being sick. And that's why we created Verily. 
fairly streamlines this process using four simple steps. First, an individually generated QR code linked to a form just like the one you see now is sent to a student. The student brings this form to their GP who fills it out. After the completion of the form, a one-time code is sent to the GP to verify their identity. All the information from the form is then sent straight to this special considerations dashboard so that there are no gaps for foul play. So, Verily follows a pay-as-you-go tiered subscription model where our subscription prices are based on the size of the organization as well as a one-off implementation fee. Technological development has created this need for Verily. We have found an untapped market opportunity placing our total addressable market to come to $565 million annually. Verily is inevitable. See, currently, UNSW spends upwards of $1.5 million per year on just two pieces of academic integrity related software. To add Verily into the mix, we less than 10% of what they're already paying. And that's why we hope that within the next year, we want to launch within the education sector after a successful pilot program in UNSW, of course, and in 18 months to have also launched within the SME corporate sector where our ideas have already been validated. Our team is uniquely positioned as innovators and students to be the team to tackle this issue. And so we invite you, those of you in the education sector and those of you who are well-versed in software development to join us in our journey to level the playing field. Thank you. Again, congratulations on your pitch. You know, Thanks. getting things, the integrity loop that you put in is really important for universities. The question I have for you, how easy is it for the doctors and the other users? Because again, part of this is not just a university, it's getting other users who would be willing to participate in this. And my second question is, are there any other one uh, other problems you see the universities face where having something like your integrity approach would be useful? Yeah, yeah, that's actually a really great question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, our process is essentially a very simple four-step process. The first of which is where, before the student actually steps into the clinic, what they'll do is they'll generate a QR form. This QR form will be attached to a, um, a QR link will be attached to a form. And the second step is for the doctor to actually fill out this form. It's a very easy form. It acts very uh, similar to the professional authority form that UNSW currently has um, on standard. And after this, uh, after they fill out this form, um, the next step is for a one-time code to actually be sent directly to the doctor's email. And this is all open source data from the regulatory services. And after the one-time code is sent, after they've verified this very simple yes or no question, um, this will be sent directly to the special considerations dashboard that UNSW has. And um, there's no gaps with tampering, things like that. Um, and just answering your second question, um, I think obviously special considerations is a huge field. And being sick is only one small little part of it, um, but currently we are very early on. We're such a young startup, so we are mainly focusing just on being sick and not really on anything else like, you know, technical difficulties or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Just adding on to that, as we progress with our development, we will definitely um, accommodate for more cases. But for now, what we wanted to do is we wanted to focus on the very general case or the most used case, which is medical certificates, which is injury, personal injuries, and things like that. I love it. I love a Thank streamlined you. process. And I think this is a real gap in the market that you're starting to tackle here. I hated going to the doctor for a medical certificate. Uh, I think that something that's really revolutionized this space is something like Instant Scripts. And I think that's a really interesting ch channel partner for you as a team. Have you thought about other potential partners you could bring in to help you scale this type of platform? Yeah. Um, so I think a big one right now is HotDoc. I'm sure everyone's used it, especially with COVID recently, and they have such a large network of just clinics. And even our mentor, uh, Mohammed from Pantea, has a huge network of private clinics that would that we would love to be in conversation with further down the path. Yeah. The, the interface with the doctor, is it, uh, is it just by, by your email or is there some other more layered system you're gonna integrate with general practice guys? Mm, yeah, so for now, um, we just were thinking of like a very one-time code. So it's acts similar to multi-factor authentication, where it's just sent directly to the email and the doctor will just give via a very yes or no question. Who's going to pay for that? Um, so for that, that will be based on the university. So um, as we said before, we have a tiered as you go, pay as you go um, subscription model. So the university will pay for that. Um, and then the whole automation will be sent directly to the doctor. So a bulk biller you're hoping for, is it? Sorry? A bulk biller? A bulk biller, yeah. There's not many of them left. 
Uh, oh, yeah. Um, but that's definitely in contention. Um, as we do progress, we do want to um, see more into it. But for now, um, our main subscription model is essentially just for the university because it's more ease of access for students and gives the students a, a more of like a um, enjoyable time as compared to the very stress that they have right now. Yeah, I think it's roll outable to the more general uh, business model to business community for sure. You know, it's a, just a pain in the ass doing it the way it happens at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank cool. you so much, Team Verily. I see you over there. Come grab your seat. Next up, we're hearing from Property AI. We are Property AI, and we use artificial intelligence to transform the property search journey with intelligent recommendations, as well as provide risk mitigation from being priced out of the housing market in the transition from your old property to your new one. We just want to ensure that Australia continues to be one of the best places to live on Earth, and we see the housing crisis as a threat to the Australian way of life and the capacity to own your own home. And we strongly believe by harnessing artificial intelligence to expand the bias agency market, we can help navigate Australians through this crisis. Give it up for Team Property AI. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to ground zero of the Australian housing crisis. With 40% of Australians moving every five years, even homeowners risk being priced out upon selling. With it taking on average nine months to find and buy a property, and with the 23.9% increase in property prices last year, now more than ever, buyers are being priced out of the market and are left renting for years. For instance, imagine you are Lucy. You have a new baby on the way. The studio that you bought five years ago just isn't enough. You look every day for a new home, but you can't seem to find the right one and for months, you struggle. You need some help. You need a buyer's agent, but they aren't cheap. Roughly costing $15,000, often with upfront fees and no guaranteed outcomes. That's when you come to Buyer's Agent, a digital platform that learns your property search behavior by considering over 150 property attributes, as well as utilizing the search behavior of thousands like you. Powered by recommendation models similar to that of e-commerce giants like Amazon, we will make recommendations of properties and locations that you have never considered but fit your behavioral search criteria and needs. We will even give you property suggestions on properties that are likely to sell within the next three months so you can reach out to property owners yourself and jump ahead of everyone else. So great, now you've found your dream home. But do you have the cash? Are you like the vast majority that need to sell their current home before they buy their next? Are you afraid of selling your home only to be priced out? Well, great news, great news for you. In partnership with a financier and using our advanced valuation models, we have developed the best of both worlds deal, which allow financiers to ride the property market by providing you the bridge in finance to buy your new home and guaranteeing the sale of your old home, and all whilst using our referred agents to sell your old home. All of this comes at no extra cost to you as if you were to normally sell your house. Awesome, now you have a new home ready to move in that fits your needs. We'll be using a freemium model in order to drive traction for our recommendations. However, the majority of our fees will be coming from co-agency with fees being collected on the origination of loans as well as the commission referrals and property sales. This idea of co-agency came from, an, from a meeting that we had with Ray White. They went for three hours with Ray White CEO Brian White and CTO Matt Gay who emphasized the value of finding sellers. So how big is the pie? With an annual gross agent commission of $624 billion in 2022, we have an obtainable market of $2.8 billion based on the buyer's agent's estimated commission referrals on property sales alone. So how do we compare? We are the best of both worlds. We have the ability to scale like a SaaS and provide the personalization of buyer's agent at a fraction of the price. Not to mention the ability to mitigate the financial risks that happens during the transition of your next home. My co-founder, Jan, and I have backgrounds in real estate and AI, and our plan is to establish a special purpose working group to validate our concept. Then we will create a full potential plan, ultimately bootstrapping our idea via crowdfunding and or partnerships with the goal to reach a Series A by 2022 or 2023. Our ask is to add to our list of suitable candidates to help form our special purpose working group. We have our data sets ready, we have our base materials being trained, and we are looking forward to engaging co-ventures with sellers or buyers agencies. Thank you. Yeah. 
very interesting. Uh, and I guess given the current housing uh, pressures for finding places, it's uh, even more interesting. Um, the, you're, you're, you're not charging anyone anything for this service other than the uh, providers in the system. Is that the way I understand it? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, we in our discussion with Ray White, they basically mentioned how there's a 20% commission on any referred sales of the agent's commission. Mm. And so we found that if we just refer these uh, property buyers who need to sell their home in order to get their next home, we've guaranteed our sale of a, of a buyer who <clears throat> needs to sell their home and therefore we can get that 0.4% commission on their total house price. Okay, how do you fill your pipeline for uh, uh, sellers? How do you find them? Well, throughout the, the buyers. So 73% of, of buyers, uh, real estate residential buyers in Australia, are actually also sellers. They are either upsizing or downsizing. So uh, we get essentially 73% of, of those um, well, through our pipeline. And you'll be competing with the real estate agents who want to do the deal both ways. Uh, yes, exactly. That's why we have this subscription fee. I mean, we have a freemium and premium features. And if you use the financial... Um, services through through our referred agents then we will give you this this subscription fee um back so serves as a as a deposit or locking mechanism i'd also like to add to that that we're actually also working in conjunction with sellers agents so we aren't actually being agents ourselves we're just referring properties that need to be sold we're, we're capturing buyers who need to sell their properties because they have bridging finance and they have double mortgages to pay off so it's very easy to kind of transition them off I guess following on from that, it sounds like you have a B2B and a direct-to-consumer market, right? So that's a two-sided marketplace. How are you going to balance that? I mean, coming on from, you know, who comes first, how, which market side are you going to fill first? Well, we're going to fulfill the recommendation models first. We want to provide, we find a search tooling with realestate.com and domain very antiquated. Like it's the same sort of search tooling you'd use in your high school library. And every search you make on there doesn't help you improve your next search. And we think that is a missing piece in the market. And so by making this freemium model and these recommendation models really good, by considering things like location isn't radius based, but rather transportation time based, we can start to open up our search for what is a perfect property for you that fits your budgets much better than realestate.com who make the vast majority of their money from just advertisements, right? All right, I think we can leave it there. Thank you so much, Property AI. Thank you. Another co-founder direct off the plane. We had a nice little moment of sharing some eye drops backstage. We're going to throw to Team Trevler. Our startup's called Trevler, and we're building an AI-powered trip itinerary builder. Travel is something that everyone wants to go on, whether you go on like a little bit of a trip to relax or you like have a bit more of a budget. We're just trying to make the planning part of that holiday not as stressful. Because everyone's busy these days. We want to make sure that the small times and they get away with their family, with their friends. So dream big. We'll help. From Trevlar. Holidays should be a fun time for us to get away and enjoy ourselves, but planning for it can be quite stressful. We've surveyed over 70 people and interviewed over five travel agencies, and what we found was that trying to find genuine and worthwhile experiences to have on holiday can be quite overwhelming. We spend countless of hours trying to find the right hotels, the right places to visit, making sure all our documentation is correct, because what's worse than looking back at a holiday with regret? In fact, this is something that most of us can relate to. So what can we do about it? Well, for your next holiday, we have Traveler, where we can help you build your dream trip with the click of a button without any of the stress. So how does it work? It's simple. You give us a couple of details such as this, and we give you a completely ge generated itinerary just for you. But say my girlfriend looks at this and she says, I don't want to eat at Tetsuya's. No worries, babe. Just tell Traveler why, and we can give you a list of alternatives, alternatives for you to pick from. Not only that, Traveller will hold your hand through the entire pre-planning stage, where we will serve you a guided timeline to make sure that you don't miss a single piece of documentation for your trip. There are 27 million travellers in a year. 
who use travel planning tools. Not only is the international tourism market rebounding at 102% post, post pandemic, the online travel agency market is expected to grow at 7% per year for the next five years. And given the increased use in active AI that we've seen within this year, the right time to build our product is right now. We're targeting millennials, Gen Zs, young families who are increasingly becoming more tech savvy. We understand that this is a saturated market, but do our competitors tackle the number one most hated part of the planning process, the admin and paperwork? No. Are they easily editable and able to be repersonalized? No. Are they quick and easy to use, fun and inexpensive? No. So these are, the, these are the things that set us apart from our competitors where we help you every step of the way. We initially planned to grow using a freemium product first because we've conducted market surveys and over 90% of people surveyed have indicated that they're willing to pay for paid premium service. From then onwards, once we have enough users and traffic to our website and application, we, further, we plan to expand further into the commission and advertise revenue streams and furthermore into the B2B SaaS software market. Our team loves traveling, which is why we want to make an impact in this space. Eva and I have backgrounds in finance and law, and Howe and Yun are both computer science stu master's students with backgrounds in computer science and development. So tonight, we actually have a huge announcement to make. We just landed our first partnership with a company who's going to help us develop our prototype and to market it to their clients as well. So our ask for you, we have two things. One, we'd love to have any introductions to anyone or any person that you may know who would be willing to partner with us to develop and promote us. And secondly, for everyone to scan that QR code over there so that you can join our waitlist. And in turn, we can, make you, we can help make you a happier traveler. Thank you. Thank you, that was a very exciting pitch. Making people happy is always wonderful. Um, a couple of questions. I love the way that you have your sort of distinctive characteristics of what, I mean, the documentation and the timelines are, are wonderful as well. But again, I'm still thinking through, how do you get people to know that you are different? How do you get people to know that what, why you know, you're distinctive compared to all your competitors? And have you thought about maybe partnering with some of the people who you view as competitors because of their market reach and brand? Amazing question. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that question, amazing question. Um, can we click to slide one, please? Amazing, okay, so um, in terms of our outreach, we plan to, of course, do the normal social media marketing, so that is kind of known, and that includes actually some influencer partnerships. So as you mentioned, how are we going to let people know the ins and outs of our products? Well, we can um, partner with some influencers, we're targeting kind of small to medium influencers for now, um, and have them be able to show our product in their travel vlogs or their travel planning. And in return, they can be part of our um, recommended media player list and get priority for the kind of media that we push to our clients in letting them know what's exciting about their upcoming holiday. Of course, that also leads me into something unique that we've thought about, which is travel agency advertisement. So travel agents might seem like one of our competitors since they also plan our itinerary and kind of um, hold your hand along the planning process. However, we are actually very different from them. So travel agencies kind of take that high, um, like high level, very fluent, but very expensive service spot. And we have this dichotomy between them and the alternative, which is a no cost convoluted self-research um, prospect. We kind of fill that middle market. And so through our interviews with some travel agents, um, three of them have already said they would very much like to have our product to recommend to clients, perhaps for um, their own preliminary kind of hype for the holiday, but also to clients that they have to turn away because they cannot afford the expensive travel agent um, prices. Um, and that's the market that we fill and we are very proud to be filling that. Excellent pitch. I love the slides, beautiful slides. I'm a millennial and I have multiple of the apps that you put up on your competitor slide. I've got TripIt, I've got Wonderlog, I've got them all. You said you're going to be targeting millennials, Gen Zs and families traveling. That's a very saturated market. Can you define for me exactly who you want to target first? What do they look like? What's their age? What gender are they and where are they from? 
Okay, so um, our actually um, ideal customer is a young family with perhaps one or two children. So both parents are working, they're very busy, they don't have time to sit down for hours and hours looking through all the millions of hours of videos and blog posts available on the internet. Instead, they are able to trust that AI is um, a way into the future um, and enter the details, get out a trip itinerary, and very quickly be able to edit it. So they will be in their ages around 24-ish, 24, 24, 24 to 30. To there we go. And no if we balance. look at slide three, that's our... Um, what we've kind of targeted for our survey. Um, so they're really our target market and they're really who we're aiming to help with our service. And this is just a perfect example of how you use appendix slides. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> Folks, we it might have... I was noting that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We might have to wrap it up there unless it's quite a quick one, Clem. Okay. My only one was <laughs> risk. Uh, you know, given fair trading likes to look at the travel industry pretty heavily these days. Um, have you thought about what risk you're prepared to take on as a company? Yep, so um, again, actually, Egan, do you want to take Yeah, so what, oh, I'm, I'm gonna, yeah. Uh, one of the key risks was um, our, our competitors, right? So essentially, we are the first market with this type of product. So we have an edge across them in terms of um, getting to the market first, getting to agencies first with this type of new product to um, essentially you know, build our customer base. So that eliminates the risk of competitors building similar products to us because we are the first to go to that market. Also, um, just in terms of actual like governance things. So the major risk we've identified in terms of governance is that um, our visa kind of and passport admin process um, could be like erroneous if the AI is like not great, right? So to really combat that, we are definitely offering um, a guide to how you should be planning your holiday and how long um, you should be waiting to submit your passports. But at the bottom of that, we definitely plan to be linking to the actual sites um, and making sure that everyone has access to the like Our official resources, resources um, in addition to you know the kind of streamlined, quick, I need to pre be prepared like nine months before um, to actually submit my passport and get it verified. That's a smart move. Yeah. Great answer. Thank you, Team Traveller. Thank you. Next up, we hear from the team at Smart Poly. We are a Smart Poly, and in a Smart Poly, we've developed 3D printable Smart Poly materials. Our mission is to collaborate with our key partners to develop um, patient-specific bone tissue in the lab to replace bone defects through non-invasive surgeries. We really want to, um, to change and revolutionize the, uh, the way we treat it. Our ultimate goal is to make it easier and more effective for people who need it. Please welcome Nassim from Smart Poly. This is Emma, who had a nasty fall while hiking a mountain. Emma injured multiple invasive surgeries to mend her badly broken leg. Surgeons use both internal and external fixators to help her damaged bone stretch out slowly over time and fill the fractured area. Emma is not alone. Every year, more than 1.5 million people globally suffer a large scale bone defect. Our research shows that current clinical treatment, bone transport, is the second most painful surgery a person can have. Patients have to go under multiple surgeries and there's a high risk of blood loss and surgical site infection. It also cost $3 billion to Australian healthcare system. Now, imagine we create our own bone tissue in the lab to replace bone defects through one single non-invasive surgery. This is bone tissue engineering. It involves taking bone cells from the patient's own body, putting them into a 3D scaffold, and creating a functional environment for cells to grow and form a new tissue. A smart scaffolds made of smart materials can be compacted and implanted through a tiny cut. Once it is exposed to body temperature, it expands and fills the defect area. Within a year, this scaffold is fully absorbed by the body to let the newly formed tissue fill the defect area. 
In a smart poly, we've developed by resorbable, non-toxic smart polymers with human bone-like mechanical properties in the form of both filaments and polymer pellets. Medical device manufacturers can use our product to print patient-specific scapula that can be compacted later for minimal invasive surgery. Scientists believe that 3D scapulas could significantly reduce the frequent need for multiple surgeries, minimizing time, cost, and the risk of complications. Unlike our competitors, our product offers all essential features required for successful bone repair. So the global biomaterials market is booming, and by 2032, the projected size of the market we are targeting is $750 million. So um, our business model is B2B. We plan to sell directly to medical device manufacturers, and with the first 10,000 surgery, we project a revenue of $50 million. So far, we've completed our first prototype and in vitro experiments. In vivo testing is ongoing, and we plan to apply for RP and grant application by year three. Collaborating with our key partners, we plan to get this product to the market by year five. We've got a team of multidisciplinary engineers and biologists, and we're also supported by an experienced business advisor. And today, we're asking for clinicians to help us with in vivo experiments, as well as medtech advisors who connect us with medical device manufacturers. Please support us in transforming lives. Thank you so much. That's extraordinary. Now, thank, congratulations on you so far. You're just looking for clinicians. So what are the key things you need the clinicians to help you get to the next stage? Um, uh, good evening, judges. Good evening, uh, everyone. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, well, uh, we've recently completed our in vitro experiments, uh, evaluating the proliferation and cytocompatibility of the bone osteoblast cells on our developed material. So uh, at currently, we are designing in vivo experiments so we need uh, clinicians uh, to help us in designing and finalizing our experiments. And also we need to get ethical approvals for those uh, tests. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, another very interesting um, product op opportunity here. Hey, um, just tell me about your qualifications to run this company, the two of you guys. Are you the two principals in it at the moment? Two uh, principals, yes. Yeah, uh, you're actually, the guys running the company at the moment, you two of you. Yes, yes. Uh, currently, uh, Nassim and I, and uh, we've got a um, very good business advisor as well. And uh, uh, also, but uh, in the future, we're planning to uh, expand our uh, apply uh, As soon as we uh, expand our application of the mat uh, our material, we're uh, planning to grow our uh, team for... Uh, and, uh, more so I'm trying to work out, are you guys the technical team or are you guys the management team for the future? Uh, currently, Nassim is an um, R&D scientist and uh, I'm uh, working in the sales and marketing uh, parts of the, that. Uh, currently, our team. And also, we've got the business advisor. As well. Right. It's just going to require equivalent of therapeutic goods at, uh, tick to get it into the market in Australia. I mean, it seems like it's a... I mean, you just can't imp start implanting stuff in uh, in people's bodies. You need to have a whole bunch of approvals to do that, don't you? So yes, exactly. Uh, thank you so much for your question. Actually, um, as Nassim said, the in vitro test results is uh, we've got the in, in vitro test results just recently, and then um, we're seeking a clinician to help us for designing the in vivo tests. And once the in vivo test is uh, completed, and we'll um, fully ready for starting the in vivo test. We're, pl uh, we're planning to apply for a uh, provisional patent. And as soon as uh, um, <clears throat> we apply for that, we're uh, planning to get the in vivo tests, hopefully during within the 12 months time frame of the provisional mm -hmm. patent. And after that, uh, after getting the in vivo tests, we are planning to apply for a PCT patent. Yeah, and then sell our product to potential yeah. medtech advisors or pharma companies or biomaterials companies. So we don't plan to go through the TGA approval process. We want to ask them to do that for, uh, for us. Yeah. Got you. Okay, good. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank so, you so much, much. Team Smart Poly. Next up. It's Little Steps. 
Little Steps is a mobile application that is AI based and it helps young children with their mental health concerns with custom and empowering storytelling. We have created an app that focuses on early intervention and does that through stories that children can relate to and it does it in a very engaging and educational way. Our ultimate mission is to support just one child and one city and, and ultimately one world, one story at a time. Give it up for Jesse from Little Steps. Picture your child clinging onto you, tears in the corner of their eyes, as they face the idea of being without you at primary school camp, a common form of separation anxiety. You search for support, a psychologist perhaps, but with the high costs and long wait times, it seems like there is just no accessible aid. One in seven children in Australia, aged between five and 12, struggle with clinically significant mental health issues. And half of these children receive no support. We know the impact of psychologists and educators on youth mental health. With the lack of personnel, there is structural overwhelm. Little Steps fills this vital gap in early mental health support. Little Steps is a mobile AI app that is powered by AI, that incorporates key and important features that enable us to tell stories to primary school children struggling with mental health. Each child's profile is created based on parental inputs, such as their child's mental health concerns, favorite colors, animals' interests, creating entirely bespoke characters and scenes. Little Steps then directly draws on peer-reviewed academic research infusing real stories and real lessons into each story. Finally, parents are provided with a custom narrative, one that incorporates peer-reviewed, research-based, tailored strategies that children can bring into their own worlds. Little Steps leverages existing parental techniques and simply tells a story, providing an easily accessible, open source, multilingual solution that fosters connection between parents and children. Prior to the AI boom, providing tailored large-scale support for youth and mental health was impractical. But Little Steps by Harnessing AI pioneers a personalized approach, setting it apart from its competitors. 130 million children around the globe struggle with mental health, but with Little Steps' equal effectiveness in all languages, we break down those national barriers, enabling us to target and help 15% of the market. With a sudden boom in AI, and increased awareness of mental health, the time to launch Little Steps is now, which is why we envision getting to market with subscription, freemium, tiered revenue model within this financial year. Little Steps ensures that we can partner with key, key stakeholders. For example, we are currently in the midst of conversations to undergo an MVP with schools in the North Shore and the Eastern Suburbs. And after this, we'll look for partnerships in the mental health organizations, as well as schools enabling us to leverage B2B2B, B2B2C channels. Our team comprises myself, the primary business strategist, Matt Gordon, the UI UX designer, and our advisor, Dan Sean, CEO. Additionally, to close a technical gap, we are currently recruiting a software engineer and our final talks with a specific one. Little Step has been validated by psychologists, psychiatrists, school principals, counselors, and more, who we are working closely with to ensure a safe output. Ultimately, our goal is to help one child one family, one country, and one world a little step at a time. Thank you. Great pitch, well done. Uh, obviously a very important space, particularly as we see increasing anxiety in children after COVID. Um, you're clearly the domain expert here as a, as a tutorer. Why are you so passionate about this and what have you seen in your work that will make parents and educators pick up this tool? Well, I think the first inspiration actually comes from my personal life. I've seen close family and friends go through mental health illnesses that were preventable with early intervention. With the lack of resources, that didn't happen. So, and beyond with tutoring, I, pri I primarily tutor primary school children and I've seen the effect that anxiety, depression have not only on their social, but also on their learnings. So I really feel like this is a really important space that we're both very passionate about. Again, congratulations and pitch, and I can absolutely see your passion. And we are being hit by a tsunami of mental health challenges. So you have got a, a wonderful solution because I've seen these before in the past many years ago, but you're right, 
the AI now could actually give us a scalable solution. My question for you is, particularly when dealing with children, you've got to be incredibly careful, both of the data collect and how you interact. What are some of the safeguards that you've started to think through in those? Yeah, so we have three strategies to ensure the integrity and security of our stories. The first one is controlled inputs, meaning AI can only work with what we give it. And all of our prompt data comes from our child's profiles and a professionally overseen database containing our academic research. Secondly, we have algorithmic testing, meaning when a story is originally created, we can run an algorithm to test four, five, even six times on the story to ensure, ensure that all of these standards are up always at the best level. And finally, we have the human quality control aspect, meaning we'll have people working in our team to sample test both the stories and the algorithm tests. I'm, I'm sensing this could actually be a broader market than uh, just the uh, sort of like people with a difficulty at the time. I mean, uh, anyone that's got any form of loneliness or whatever, I mean, could yeah. fit this. So you can, it's, it's sort of like it's a much bigger market if you can get it off the ground than, uh, than what you've currently described. Um, so uh, you've particularly gone down this route. Obviously, is, is there a commercial benefit in going down the, this route or are you going down it for other reasons? Well, I think there's definitely a commercial benefit. Obviously, there's a social benefit. But in terms of commercial benefit, there's a lot of awareness that's being driven for youth mental health. And I think if we're able to take advantage of this, that'll make, make a big difference to our company. But also the fact that if we're able to focus on the specific market, I think we're able to delve in deeper. But we're, as you said, we're really looking to expand and we'll look to, for other people and who are struggling and not just with mental health, but we're really looking to affect as many people as possible. I think the, the, the model you've got to look at for, for you guys is um, uh, it's, a diff it's an interesting one because schools traditionally have got no money to put anywhere. I mean, I've, yeah. I've tried the ed market a few times and uh, they're pretty lousy. It's sort of like shutting out the uh, shekels. Um, the, so it's the parents you're going to have to get to actually pay, but getting the school endorsement seems to be the name of the game from exactly. where, you, where you come from. That, that sort of like ticks off pedagogy and ticks off risk for parents and things like that. Exactly. And lays a bit of stuff back on the school to yeah. take the risk. That, that's exactly the reason. And the fact we've already got traction with multiple schools at the moment shows that they're incentivized to utilize an app. They need tools to support their children. And something like this, that if we can get traction, get the foot in the door with a few schools, it hopefully won't be long until we can access schools, not just throughout Sydney, not throughout New South Wales, but throughout the world. Good luck. Thank you. Give it up for Team Little Steps. That was our 10th pitch. We are through the pitches for tonight. What an incredible group of 10 early stage student-driven startups that we've seen tonight. So now's your time to shine as an audience. We're gonna set a three minute timer. You get three minutes uh, while our judges head off to make their deliberations uh, and our, our deans uh, join Join me at the side of the stage. Three minutes for you to decide on who is the people's choice. We'll play some music. We'll give you a few minutes. We're wrapping things up. I trust you've got your votes in. And I trust also you probably saw on a seat next to you or the seat that you sat down uh, a bit of a flyer. We did a seat drop. And so for those of you in the room, students, who are looking to take the leap and embark on a founder's journey, we have a program lined up for you next year. Imagine dedicating a full year to transforming your bright idea into a tangible, scalable venture, supported by a world-class academic curriculum and a global network of mentors. The UNSW Startup Year isn't just another program, but it's an incubator for ambitious founders like you. We've opened expressions of interest for the 2024 startup year, and you can find out more by scanning this QR code or checking out the flyer that's on your seats there. Now, without further ado, I think we're gonna start announcing some awards. So first up from the Faculty of Science, we have uh, Associate Professor Alison Beavis, who's Deputy Dean of Education. I'm gonna invite Alison to share a few words about why she's sharing this award. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I love this evening. Um, science has been on, on a journey with the Peter Farrell Cup team since, I think, 2021 when we first um, sponsored a, a Dean of Science Award. And 
this evening has, has exceeded all expectations once again. Um, science obviously has a, a real passion for supporting student entrepreneurs and that, that idea of translating ideas into impact is something really at the heart of, of what the faculty really values um, and wants to, to help students um, achieve. So without further ado, I think the evening there was a, a celebration of AI and that is something that really shone through in the pitch this evening. And the, the idea that every Australian should be able to find their ideal um, home is the award winner, Property AI. Congratulations to Jan and James. Thank you. Congratulations, team, Property AI. Next up, from the Faculty of Medicine and Health, we have Professor Phoebe Phillips, who's Associate Dean of Partnerships and Engagement. Welcome, Professor Phillips. Good evening, everyone. What an inspirational group of people we've witnessed tonight in their growth and their early innovation. Um, in the Faculty of Medicine, we're all about how do we impact the community, social impact, health impact, and we saw many um, of these projects this evening focus on that. Um, for us, it's about an unmet need, and for tonight, the winner for the Dean's Award for the Faculty of Medicine really focused on an unmet need, minimising surgical impact across millions of people, potentially, and so I would like to present this award for the Smart Scaffold to Smart Poly. Um, congratulations. <laughs> congratulations, Nassim and Hassan. Congratulations, Team Smart Polly. Got some fantastic teams in the wings. And here from the Faculty of Engineering, we have Professor Ian Gibson, who's Deputy Dean of Industry Engagement, Innovation and Research. Welcome, Ian. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. So what a fantastic crew we've seen tonight. This was a really, really hard decision to make from the perspective of engineering, where we try and bring technology to help people's lives. With the team that we're going to award this to tonight, they place the people in the front and centre of the design and the technology in the background. They have very uh, creative approach, they've already got customers, but more than that, they help those that need our help. So the engineering prize goes to Team Splat. Congratulations, Team Splat. From the Faculty of Business, we're pleased to have Professor Karen Sanders, who's Senior Deputy Dean of Research and Enterprise. Thank you. Good evening to all of you. It's good to see so many people. The Peter Ferro Cup is very close to my heart uh, because for many years, it, it, it was hosted by uh, faculty of business, and I was a host for some years and some other professors in our school. So it's lovely to see so many people now. The award for um, the business is a very excellent and very passionate HSM MBA student team who presented a very impressive novel solution for an important problem in a very growing market. The award is going to Innova ICS. Congratulations, team Innova IVF. 
Our final Dean's Award comes from the Faculty of Arts, Design and Architecture. Professor Claire Annesley, who's the Dean of Arts, Design and Architecture, joins us here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the vision of the Faculty of Arts, Design and Architecture is that through creativity, collaboration and inclusion, we seek and solve problems to improve life on earth. And I think all of the pictures that we saw today do that. Um, it's an incredible honor for me to have the opportunity to present an award for innovation excellence. The pitch that we decided to offer this award to is one that is current, well-developed, doable. It's an innovation that meets a very, very current need to connect people and to build back community after a number of years of disruption. And it had a bunny. My award goes to What's On. <laughs> Congratulations team, what's on? I'm fairly confident that's the first time we've ever had a rabbit on stage at the Peter Farrell Pub. Now, I thought I'd have to do a little bit of vamping, but it looks to me like our judges are on the side of the stage ready to go. So I'm gonna invite our judges on stage uh, and they will announce our next awards. And while they're joining me on stage, I, I wanna share some thanks. The Peter Farrell Cup could not exist without many of you tonight who are in the audience and many people who couldn't be here tonight. So first of all, the students and participants who every year show up, they really put their all into developing these ideas and their pitches. Their mentors who spent 10 weeks supporting them, many of you are in the audience, thank you. To the speakers who taught them all about market sizing and customer discovery and prototyping, Thank you so much. And of course, to the team who delivers the Peter Farrell Cup, who are from UNSW Founders, who's here to support them. And finally, the Farrell Family Foundation. The Peter Farrell Cup couldn't exist without Peter Farrell's initial vision of supporting entrepreneurship and UNSW. And it couldn't have existed for 23 years without the continued support of the Farrell Founda Family Foundation. So for that, we're incredibly grateful. Our first award, second place, $3,000. I'd like to welcome Attila to the stage to announce the winner. Thank you very, thank you very much. The first thing I'd like to do is, is just congratulate all the incredible finalists tonight. The first time I saw this was about 10 years ago. It was extraordinary then, but it's even more extraordinary tonight. We're talking backstage. The competition gets better and better, and the pitches tonight are every single one of them are extraordinary. The thing I love about working in university is you get to work and see incredible students who tackle the biggest problems in society in the most simple way. So, a real congratulations to all of them. I'd also like to thank the founders team. So, if we could just congratulate everyone tonight again. Now, because this team, not only are they innovative and not only they're full of energy, but they tackle a problem that keeps me awake at night. How do I make my students happy? How do we make sure that everyone on campus has the best experience at UNSW as possible? The runners up is, of course, to What's On. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations, what's on? Our first place trailblazer for a master's or PhD candidate-led team uh, who's really blazing a trail. And I'd like to welcome Camille Goldston-Henry to the stage to announce the winner.
three years ago, I was studying my MBA part-time when I started my startup. I was working full-time, I was studying my postgraduate part-time, and I was trying to get this startup off the ground. So I commend all of the postgraduate students that have pitched tonight. I know how incredibly hard it is. But ultimately, what helps get a startup off the ground when you're so incredibly busy is a really passionate team that is dedicated to solving the problem and is obsessed with the solution. So I'm so incredibly proud to announce the winners of the Trailblazer are Ropet. Congratulations, Team Ropet. <laughs> Finally, the first place, next big thing. I'd like to invite Clem Doherty to the stage to announce the winner. I will, thank you. Before I announce the winner, I, I must just add that I, I was a judge about seven or eight years ago here. And uh, there was a couple that, that year that I wouldn't have banked. But uh, this year, it was uh, a terrific group, I must admit. I mean, I was seriously impressed as someone who spends his life these days putting a few dollars into startups. Uh, the group here was very impressive. That's a uh, startup. Secondly, uh, I'd like to say Peter Farrell does send his regards. I'm a good mate of Peter's. I've known him for about 40 years. And uh, he's, uh, he would be very proud of the group that came up here tonight. I can tell you that. And the winner of the Next Big Thing Award is Little Steps. Congratulations, team Little Steps. Now, this is the one you've kind of been waiting for, right? The People's Choice. Who did you vote for? And I'd like to welcome to the stage our Director of Entrepreneurship, David Burt, who will announce the People's Choice Award. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And I love the People's Choice Award. Um, you're all here to support these founders, so thank you very much. Uh, it's a great opportunity for them to share their vision with you and the world. And you as the audience has chosen as your People's Choice Award, SPLAT. Congratulations, Team Splat. And one last huge congratulations to all of the teams who pitched tonight. <laughs> Folks, you've been incredible. Our startups, our students, our judges have all been incredible. Now's the time to eat, drink, and be merry. We've got networking outside. I'm gonna to throw to you, it's now your time to shine. Uh, meet with the startups, enjoy some networking, and make sure you make a new friend tonight. Thanks everyone. <laughs>